can you live in the ambiguous state of not knowing what happens next? Because leaders always have one foot in the air. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Today we will be speaking with Michael Bernard, AIA, who is the founder of Virtual Practice Consulting, where he provides strategic advice to design and construction firms. Michael has been a professor in the architecture department of the California College of Art in San Francisco uh, since 2006, and he has served as a director on the board of the San Francisco chapter of the AIA and is on the AIA California Council. He's led several committees and has served as an architect advisor to the Academy for Emerging Professionals at the AIA San Francisco. So Michael discovered architecture as a 10-year-old when he was inspired by a house plan magazine at the supermarket and he started building 3D models as a child. In college, interesting, he actually studied psychology uh, with the intent of becoming a clinical psychologist and he'll talk a little bit about this in the podcast. However, whilst he was teaching French as he's trilingual, I think, um, to exchange students during a summer school, a colleague noticed him sketching and asked if he ever thought of architecture as a profession, um, which opened up a whole new world and career path. It's very interesting because we start to, in this conversation, um, Michael discusses how, you know, this evolution of his career path and how he's kind of brought these two very fascinating worlds of clinical psychology, architecture and leadership together. Um, Michael started to work in design um, and worked for Charles Moore in Los Angeles. And after some time, he went to work for larger technical firms because he wanted to learn what was the underpinning of design. Um, over the course of his career, he's always wanted more. And he finally realized that what he loved most about architecture is the creative team that makes the projects happen. So, I love talking with Michael. This was the kind of conversation that really fills me with a lot of joy. Michael was very much on the same wavelength of us here at Business of Architecture and has, you know, the underpinnings and understanding of being an architect, running his own business or working at the high levels of a successful architecture practice, and then has moved into a consulting role where he's helping lots of architects now. So in today's episode, we will be discussing the importance of defining culture in a business for high performance. Um, we discuss the evolution of leadership that all business owners must journey through, and we discuss the dangers of design react mode. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Michael Bernard. Hey, Enix Sears here from Business of Architecture, and if you've run an architectural practice, then probably one of the most difficult parts about running your practice is making sure you get your fees right, getting the right fee for the job. Because if you undercharge, ultimately, as you know what ends up happening, is you get to the end of the fee and there's still more job left. In that case, you're juggling to try to rob Peter to pay Paul, stealing from a more profitable project to support the less profitable projects. And on the flip side, you probably don't want to charge your clients absorbently too much than you actually need to get the project done. So the question is, how do you charge the right fee? Well, one resource has been lacking in the architecture industry for a long time now is some sort of guide or comparison about what architecture firms actually charge. If you try to run a Google search on it, what do architects charge, you'll find some outdated information that's wildly inaccurate. And so I just want to record this quick little video to let you know and get to so you can look forward to something that we're doing here at Business of Architecture, which is we will be launching a comprehensive fee report talking about and just revealing what architectural practices around the United States and elsewhere are actually charging, how they set their fees. Do they do percentage of construction costs? Is it stipulated sum? Is it hourly not to exceed? Also, what are the particular amounts? We're really excited about this because ever since we started uh, founded Business of Architecture over 10 years ago, this has been a common question is like, is my pricing right? Is my pricing right? And so this is the question that we hope to answer when we release in December, we'll be releasing uh, this fee report. Now, one of the advantages is of us as a consulting agency is that we can put out this kind of information. Unfortunately, as you know, if you're in the United States, a couple decades ago, the AIA got into big trouble because they published a list of 
basically like a fee chart, right? So like a fee matrix. And then the United States Justice Department decided that that was price fixing. It was it was causing a monopoly. And so they got in big trouble for doing that. Well, fortunately, from our perspective, we're not limited to talk about fees because we're not an organization. We're not a membership organization. We don't represent architecture as a whole. We're simply a consultancy. And as a matter of fact, our job and our business is to help architectural practices to succeed. So this is why we're super excited about this. So this is just a heads up. Make sure you keep your eyes out on your inbox. If you're not already on our email list, head over to businessofarchitecture.com. Make sure you sign up for our free live video training, and then you'll automatically get put onto our email list. So you will be the first to be notified when we release the fee and compensation report. All right. This is specifically tailored for you. If you're a small architectural practice owner, you'll get to see very clearly what other people of similar size firms, similar size demographics, similar typologies are actually charging, how they set their fees. So you can start to answer that big question is, I wonder how I fit into what my competitors are charging. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Michael, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Now, I'm very excited to speak with you. We've met uh, briefly previously and had a wonderful conversation uh, a few months ago. Drew, who was uh, one of the guests on the Business of Architecture a few months back, introduced me to yourself. And you've had a deeply fascinating career. You've led the life as an architect. You've been the managing principal of uh, Andrew Skirman Architects. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and then... And then you've been a professor in at universities, and now you're running virtual practice uh, consultancies where you're uh, a business consultant to architects uh, and other businesses in the construction and engineering space, helping them develop, grow, find their voice, etc. So very excited to be talking to you. I know that we've got a lot of very similar passions and interests. Um, so how do you like to be described? How would you normally describe yourself? Well, uh, I had a very hard time actually developing an elevator pitch for what I do uh, for a very long time. And a friend finally said, well, you're a managing principal for hire, like a hired gun. And I thought, well, that's okay. I'm more than nuts and bolts. I describe myself as a, a strategic a business consultant who is an architect, trained as an architect, who focuses on culture and mm -hmm. with a, an underpinning of um, nuts and bolts that support that culture and that are, that thrive in a culture. And and how did your career evolve for you to take this unconventional pathway, if you like? Well, as an undergraduate, I studied experimental psychology, really focused on the science of psychology and planned to pursue a career in clinical psychology as a psychotherapist. And uh, as a resume building exercise, I was teaching French at a prep school in Vermont uh, uh, in advance of leading high school students to live in France and Switzerland. So I did that as a way of building credibility as an undergraduate. While I was teaching, one of my co-teachers commented that I sketched really well, uh, drawing the plan of a house, waiting for my students to enter the classroom where I would write their names of the rooms in the, in the, uh, in the rooms on this architectural house plan that I'd drawn on the chalkboard and <laughs> commented, what, what are you doing in psychology? Have you thought about going to graduate school in, in architecture? Like, I literally stood there with a chalk and said, you can do that. I just had no idea. And yeah. I never pursued my career in psychology. I applied to graduate school in architecture. <clears throat> One of my professors uh, from university suggested I study under Charles Moore, which I did. Mm -hmm. And in that lucky opportunity, um, Charles Moore, who was a, a postmodernist, um, a great educator and mentor, invited me 
to join him when he was selected as the architect in residence at the American Academy in Rome. So I went, and the reason I'm telling you this is that I started my career in architecture deep in design, that I focused on design. That was what I, my passion, that was my passion. Mm -hmm. And, but after graduation, I worked for Charles for a little bit and I quit. I just, I, it, design wasn't enough for me and I couldn't really define why, but it just, as you know, I was working in a great office. I had great colleagues, a great environment in which to work, but I kept wanting to extend my, my understanding of practice. So what supports design? How do you put a set of drawings together? What are the mechanical, structural, electrical elements that you have to build into this? How do I manage two projects? How do I manage other people? How do I manage teams and so on? And I just kept wanting to understand the larger context of, of practice to the point where 25 years later, I was working on a $100 million overwater historic preservation project for the port of San Francisco and a private client in a partnership that had never been done before. I was mm -hmm. overseeing 35 employees on one project and I had an epiphany that I was more interested in and am more interested in the well-being of my team as much as or more than the design of the project. The project mm -hmm. is beautiful. It's Pier 1 on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. I encourage people to walk around the pier. We created one acre of public space and the bay sounds different when you're 700 feet over the water. Uh, it was a great project, the first of its kind in San Francisco. And at that moment, I shifted my attention, not my career yet, to, yeah. to taking care of my team. Um, it would be a number of years before I ultimately started virtual practice, but that was where the seed was planted. Interesting. It's almost like your psychology background starts to... The, the, the deep interests there start to kind of come back and you're starting to see a, a very applied psychology, if you like, in the, in the behavior of an organization and the behavior of a, of a team. Right. And I, I think, although the words I put to my experience came much later, I realized that, you know, there, that there's a fundamental way that I approach my work with my clients. And I'll ask them, if they're in alignment and they'll wonder what I mean. And I ask, mm -hmm. is what you do in alignment with how you are in the world? Are you the full expression of who you want to be? And does that align with what you do? And I think my career and my, my professional evolution really speaks to that. I know it worked for me. I think architecture of all the professions is potentially the most entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And yet so many of us attach ourselves to the, to what we receive and think that that's the only way to express it, to be it. And my question is, if you're in sync with that, great, run with it. But if you feel some kind of conflict, let's go deep and figure out why. Because mm -hmm. I believe that architecture can be uh, a lot of different things for different people as a professional. I think this, I'm curious to hear how you came to your, your engagement with it. Um, I'm still a licensed architect. I, you know, on my tax return, I write architect. I've signed drawings. I've had my own practice, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I just felt, you know, for a long time that, um, I had my own practice and, um, and we dissolved it after a short time and I, and I was on my own and I just felt like I was walking on one leg. I can't, I'm, you know, I have my own engagement with it, but I need to be around other people. And so we find these things like, is it about the building? Is it about the process of design? Do I need to be around other people? Is architecture kind of social engagement? I think it is. I think, yeah. and I have a lot to say about education. I think it's taught as though architecture is a solitary endeavor in fact it's it's intensively collaborative mm -hmm. that um that it's it's not it's not an endeavor that that uh happens by one white man alone it happens yeah. in 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 
groups. I, I think what you're saying is really deeply fascinating and does it resonates with my own story, if you like, as well. And one of my own frustrations with architecture was, yeah, university, you're kind of trained and taught to think as an individual, if you like. And this social component of it is largely missed out. And for somebody who naturally wants to be interacting and talking with people, I struggled then going into practice where you were then sat at desks and, you know, interaction. The, the social side of the practice was much more interesting than, say, the actual, you know, spending lots of late nights just working through very dry drawings and and details. Um and and I, and I and I know that that's an experience that lots of students go through. There's this big sort of chasm, if you like, when people come out of university, um, more so than I would imagine with something like some of the other professions like law or medicine, where there's a very practical element to what it is that you're being trained to do. Architecture does, you know, certain mod certainly a lot of the modern schools and the cosmopolitan areas attempt to blow open the possibility of what what architecture could be which is great and has a lot of value to it but it also means that when you step into the profession then we've got a very confused idea of what the profession is supposed to be about and if and sometimes this idea of the social or the community or the group or the the softer skills the emotional intelligence all this sort of stuff has been has been missing and we see that a lot in businesses Right. No, I, I, I'm thinking immediately of education and how in one local university here in New York, mm -hmm. you know, it's often that, that the students in the architecture school are the first members of their families to attend a, a, an institute of higher education. Mm -hmm. So they attend architecture school and then, and, and coming from, um, coming to, uh, an elitist profession, and then trying to get work in an elitist firm is those are two cultural leaps that that I think have that that the that the firms and the institutions need to work towards the students rather than the students trying to adopt some outdated way of practice. And mm -hmm. we're at this moment right now where we're conscious of that. I wouldn't say that the repair is there yet. That's okay. Mm -hmm. You got to you know, just be present with how uncomfortable it is. Yeah, sure. But you know, if 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 a large corporate firm is trying to recruit from this school, what you know, there's the potential for uh, a communication gap. And mm -hmm. so, so what I'm getting at is, you know, it's this is a profession that it's an old profession, and we receive knowledge as if it's always been that way, and for a long time we did not question it, we modified mm -hmm. it. And now we have this opportunity to interrogate it and to break it apart and understand, for example, that it's collaborative, not sole, you know, mover. It's not one pencil. And, yeah. and so I think we're in this really sort of wonderful moment where we can look at that and again, get back to who am I? What am I practicing? How do I interpret this thing that I, I'm going to school to learn? And how will I fit in the larger world of architectural practice? When you're working with clients, then what sorts of things lead them to you in the first place? And how do they recognize that they might have a organizational problem? Uh, it all, I think they may not have a finger on what it is, or they might find one, one issue that they, they, they can identify. Often, very often, it has to do with recruitment or employee training. Um, Sometimes it's marketing or business development. Uh, it all comes back to the culture of the place, but we mm -hmm. don't know. We don't use that word right away. They might say, well, I want to make more money or could you help me write this contract? Um, or how, how do I teach my leadership to, to manage projects more effectively? And then we have conversations about, uh, how leadership can take more responsibility. So we might, you know, put a pin in the one thing. For example, uh, the hardest thing I think is is um, is delegating for a principal or a group of principals to delegate to staff. 
we think in the present moment, like oh, I've got all these projects and my leadership isn't managing the projects properly or, or they are, but I'm not sure if they are. Uh, so we give them tools. The first thing I do is give them a few tools or, um, how, you know, build a budget, set a schedule, really simple, not even using software, just use a pencil and paper and, um, and create the space for people to talk about what a schedule might be. You know, that is a minor design project, but it, it, it is necessary to understand how your project moves ahead in time. So I'll speak like this yeah. in very simple terms, but really what we're talking about, that that's one little piece. And the bigger thing is what's the culture in which, what's the context in which this, this question appears? Mm -hmm. um, you know, at some point, can a principal give up drawing every detail so that other people can draw details so that that founder, that principal can go on to other things like getting more business or taking a three week vacation with their family. You know, there is just, can they let go? And if mm -hmm. it's not just irresponsibly letting go because ultimately they have to sign the drawings, but, yeah. but generously letting go with a structure underneath that mentors staff that encourages senior staff to mentor the generation below. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm working with a number of firms in that way where I work with a principal, some principals I meet with weekly and we talk about these issues every week because it's a, it's an evolving, it's an evolving organism. And we'll talk about, you know, how the leadership is growing and are they now learning to mentor the so their subordinates or the, the people that work under them. Do they work in silos with one support person or do they have this wonderful thing where they haggle over staff across their silos, which knits them together? Part of it is conversation. And, you know, we don't have to be talking all the time, but conversations between staff are really, really important. I think that's part of the, what's been straining firms during the early days of the pandemic is yeah. that people aren't, aren't in the same space to talk about minutia or the big stuff or see how the senior people do it or the junior people do it and not have eyes on, uh, on, on, um, not having ears and eyes on kind of the con the container of, of where the work is going. I, I love this idea that, you know, actually kind of nurturing a set of conversations between staff members is it has an enormous amount of benefit that you know is kind of it is it can be very easily overlooked if you like and perhaps if we consider I don't, i'd love to hear your take on this you know on on defining what cu culture is but we there is a a kind of way that we could look at a business if you like as a series of conversations and the quality of those conversations is a kind of reflection of the culture and perhaps you know a, a company's core values might be families of conversations or a kind of a theme for conversations that you want to see existing mm -hmm. in inside of a, a business mm -hmm. um how how do you then kind of evolve or, or help nurture a leader so that they can have this conversational environment existing underneath them well again i come back to that question are you is you know are you in alignment with are who you are and what you do in alignment and mm -hmm. what do you, where do you want to take your firm? You know, it's, 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 it's extremely important to understand what goals a founder might have. It doesn't mean they have to realize them, but to be, but to be drawn to a point in the future, living in the present, but being pulled to something and understanding that there are consequences and opportunities along the way, like hiring the right person to be my successor that that could be a 10 year plan. Um, and we, it's huge risk. Yesterday, actually, I met with a group of my clients, about 12 clients in a, in an online kind of round table. It's the first time I've ever done this. It's kind of a harebrained idea that firms that I've worked with for 15, anywhere from four to 15 years. And I, and I brought, invited them all, brought them all together in a one hour zoom. And I asked them to vote on topics that um, 
that were of interest so that we could discuss as a group. And we will meet probably every three months. We'll pick a topic. We'll talk for an hour. It isn't necessarily that we will find solutions. We will have conversations and break down the barriers because many of these people actually know each other um, mm -hmm. in New York and San Francisco and Berkeley and Hudson Valley. And, and, and they're, to know that you have peers is a really powerful thing because we, you know, in the same way in an office, we work in silos, we work in silos in our culture, but actually two comments came out of this seminar that were really valuable. One is here we are 15 years down the road and we're all the, the we're all aware that we're still trying to figure it out, still trying to figure it out. It mm -hmm. is, it is emerging. It never stops emerging. And the second thing is from a wonderful article that I read, recently passed it on to clients about how risk, how we, we can integrate risk into our business plan, that risk suggests growth, that risk is a vital element of any business. And, uh, and so we talked about risk, like what, what risks are there and the topics that's kind of the points that came up, like learning that I picked the wrong successor and, and I know the signs now and, being aware of what it's not like we make mistakes. It's just like, we don't know till we do it. That's risk. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that when you ask me what it is, I bring to clients, what I've just described is the arc. It starts with a tool, you know, here's, here's a symptom of, or here's evidence of your culture and let's mm -hmm. propagate it and see where, what the context is, where it, where it um, exists. What do you want to change? What's fundamental, essential? And then meeting other peers across the boundaries of, pra of individual practices to see that other people are struggling with the same thing, that there's a bigger mm -hmm. cultural container for how we do our work. It's not just us. It's not just our employees. Yeah. There's, there, there's a bigger context. Well, what are some of the challenges that you often see with leaders of architectural practices in this journey of their own evolution to becoming a leader, if you like. And I, and I think how you were describing it earlier of, of, it sounds obvious in many ways to, for people to let go of their tasks and to delegate it. And almost in a way, you know, every architect kind of wants to do that. They want to have more free time to be thinking about the things that they want to be doing, but there's also lots of stuff that they don't want to be doing or the role of being a firm owner or a business owner. It, that that wasn't what I signed up for. I, I I didn't sign up for this. Right. I mean, if look, if 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 we were meant to be good business people, we would have had a, a full course of business administration or something. But in fact, in the American uh, pedagogy and curriculum, there's one course in a three year master's program that that uh, you know is responsible for like forty percent of the credit of applying, you know, down the road when you're trying to get your internship credits, one course of 12 weeks. And in that course, you're supposed to learn about contracts and, and liability and risk and all these things. It's, it's not thorough. <laughs> mm. We we're all trying to figure it out uh, from the point of view of, of, of an architectural profession. It's not, mm -hmm. we don't get the business training. I hope that answers your question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, my critique or criticism, if you like, of, of university um, is often that it is very design focused. We're trained in this idea of a silo. You're trained as an individual. You know, sometimes you might do a bit of group work, but, you know, when I talk to academics or their professors, teachers they don't like doing group work with students because they the students don't like it and it gets all competitive and there's all sorts of politics that start to emerge that make it complex but there is a strong negation if you like or there is the business component missing and it's never set in that economic environment it's never set in the economic context and we learn to deal with all these wonderful constraints and you know from in the environment to engineering to um, to even to the, the social and, and, uh, and, and physical, and we get very creative 
and thoughtful about how we can handle those create uh, those constraints and turn them into architecture but when it comes to say finance it's like whoa no let's leave that one out right and you figure that figure it out when you get when you get there yeah and and yet we're so you know exposed so one thing i realized very early in my own professional development and i see this in in young firms is an unease with the contract and with mm-hmm. billing. Uh, and so to give an example in each, the AIA uh, has just a comprehensive uh, catalog of contracts. And, and you know, sometimes we pick the wrong one or I will get calls from uh, clients and I'll ask, well, which, which one do I use? And we'll go through that. Well, why wouldn't I use the, the B105 instead of the B101? It's shorter. I say, well, look, here's why. Here's where your exposure is. And I'm not an insurance agent. I'm not a lawyer. But yeah. you know, there's there's a there's a lack of the contracts are accessible. No problem. You can buy one. You can make your own bespoke contract. Great. But I think, you know, we're not always comfortable with the language in there. We just kind of put stuff in it and send it off and we mm-hmm. some small number of of professionals don't really know it's in that contract or in their contract. So we talk through that. Um, and then if, if the principal doesn't know, and then the employee is supposed to execute the intent of the contract, who's learning what from whom? So that's one place where I can be really valuable and say, Hey, let's have a conversation about the 12 or 13 paragraphs or articles of the contract. And then, Mm -hmm. How do you want to explain it to your staff? Because I'm not going to, because whatever I say may be wrong or at odds with, or you may not want them to know, blah, blah, blah. So yep. that's those that's part of the conversation. Um, and uh, so that's, that's kind of, I think that's, that's really important. And the other is billing. Some firms will build on dysfunction and think they're doing it right. For instance, um, they, a, a principal may not bill uh, for three months. And let's say that that's a, it's a residential project. They're billing $10,000 a month on each project. Um, they don't bill for three months and now the client gets a bill for $30,000. Where are they going to find that money? So, and how, how am I funding my practice if I'm not billing every month? If I don't say with my bookkeeper or on my own, on the fifth business day of every single month, I'm going to do my billing regardless. And, and yes, I have deadlines, but actually this thing is my business. It's a design project and I need to commit to this. Clients have to wait. And I know we think, Oh my God, we can't make a client wait. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but we do because eventually that $30,000 that we do get paid, we think, Oh, we got paid, but then we think, okay, I only have to bill every three months. It, it, it's a self-reinforcing dysfunction and that's risky. Because the yes. client then has to, is embarrassed, perhaps, that they now have to go to their banker or their, you know, however they get their money, and then mm-hmm. they have to wait till that agency oh. approves it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, th- th- this is very interesting because in you know I've I've dealt with clients in the past. The worst scenario I've seen of this very thing was a client who hadn't billed their own client for about seven or eight months Mm -hmm. and there was a fee that had totaled up for about seventy thousand dollars and of course when you send that to a client what what they're gonna say what's this for hold on a minute right this is this this doesn't work and i I was looking through in the uk the the uh, the kind of code of conduct for an architect and one of the elements one of the things in the code of conduct is to look after or to be responsible around the client's finances Mm -hmm. and to be able to guide and to advise on them Mm -hmm. and yet i cannot think of any point even in the professional part of our education where we're trained to do that or to have some kind of comfort in doing it and so and what you're sort of saying there this billing with dysfunction is exactly against the kind of code of ethics if you like Mm -hmm of being an architect where we're meant to be helping and facilitating and, you know, the, the flow of money. And it means being responsible in terms of, you know, making sure that we're getting paid on time. Yes. And, and the, as in the UK, there's a corresponding paragraph in many of the AIA standard documents that say the architect must keep the client aware of design mm-hmm. progress and finance and so on. 
it's one line, but I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty heavy line. Um, yeah. Well, how, yeah, go ahead. I, I guess the next question is, is how do we build in to a company into an architecture company, a culture of business or a culture of money, particularly, because that's the one where we all sort of, it, we feel like it's at odds with our design or creativity. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that it, it is, it is time to break that habit. It seems like it's an elitist carryover from a time when people didn't have to worry about money, but we all do. I mean, reality is we have to. Uh, and I think, you know, there, uh, to talk about money, it's very uncomfortable uh, for an architect who isn't trained to be comfortable and about talking about money. Uh, and I think that's basically it is we're not, we provide a service. I think architects are, are wired to, to provide, to produce, and we want approval. And if there's something that we're concerned about um, that might garner disapproval, like asking for money, you know, it's just, it's a, it, 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 there, there's potential for holding back. I'm not saying this about everyone and it's not a blanket statement, but there is hmm. the, the potential for holding back, asking for something, um, that, that validates further validates this design that we're producing. I, 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 I've never really been able to understand it, but, um, but it's a point of discomfort for many architects, not for everyone, this, mm -hmm. but I've seen evidence of that. Uh, I, I, and the way to correct that or to introduce comfort is to, is to, is to build in intention at the beginning of a project. We may be in dysfunction on every other project, but on the next one that comes through, let's build, let's try to practice intention about how we will bill on a monthly basis. And when we're, you know, the fees, fees increase at CDs. And so as we're preparing to uh, file for permit or design review, uh, we probably are putting in more hours at that point to fill out, to complete the drawings, to the document package. And so it helps to let a client know at the beginning of that phase, you know, we're about to add two people to the project. Our billings have been X and now they're going to be three X. We want you to know so that you're not surprised. Building in that, just that conversation creates the opportunity to acknowledge the client and their cash flow and that we will get paid more promptly. At the end of that, if the client is reluctant to pay or slow to pay, we can say, look, we told you back at the first of the month or two months ago, that the next two months would be really intensive and we, we need to get paid for that work. So we, so the way to solve it in a way is to be intentional mm. at the beginning and not just let things happen. I think it comes from the following. I'm going to give an example that weak as it is, I'll, I'll give an example. A client on a single family home. Uh, wanted uh, uh, a storage facility for two cars, uh, also known as a garage. And, uh, but, but they couldn't decide whether it should be side-by-side, -side, stacked in an elevator, side-by-side -side with a dwelling unit on top. Um, they had all these. So it's, and, and the, there were two partners involved uh, on the client side, and they were not in agreement. And they would, the architect would get, you know, one of those proposals from one and then the other from the other. And the reaction from the architect was to provide design solutions, solution, solution, solution. Mm. Instead of what I recommended, which is like, let's pause here for a moment. Let's meet with the clients and say, look, before we go into design react mode, I don't, you know, I'm, are we in alignment about our process, our process? Because I'm hearing from partner A that they want it this way. Partner B disagrees. We don't meet at the same time. This isn't working. We can produce, 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 and you'll be unhappy with our bills. We can generate solutions. Our process is not efficient in the way that we are arriving at solutions. Can we talk about that? And most clients are not, you know, most, you know, many clients are not used to being, uh, addressed that way. Yeah. Um, you know, these are often, if it's a high end residential, the very high end residential, 
they're individuals who are responsible for 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 people and to a board of directors. And then all of a sudden they're in this process that they're not the leader, but they still act like the leader. So can we bring it back to, without pointing fingers, just say, look, let's get our process in alignment here. And not every client's going to respond well to that, but many do. It also applies to the billing. Just in, in, you know, integrating intentionality. Like, what are our mm. goals here? Are we just receiving a project and we're going to go and do what we've always done without thinking? That's what, it, that, you know, that's a different kind of pra practice or process that is not necessary. Are, we have to ask ourselves, is this intentional? Are we awake? Mm -hmm. Are we with this process? Or are that's we so interesting. Yeah. The, the way that you've described this, the, the, the design react mode. I like this. This it's, is. It's a safe place. You know, I know what I'm doing. I can do this. I can stick and hold on to this. I can, I can design, <laughs> react, design, react, and I'm in a safe place, but I'm not, am I paying attention to the context in which I'm behaving? Mm. How do we, how, how do you advise leaders then to bring in the kind of conversation around money, for example, internally? So here we're talking about uh, a relationship with a client. What sorts of challenges do we see internally, particularly when we're talking about, you know, you've got team members, there's underperformance might be a common problem that happens. And we'll certainly, you know, you'll, you'll see one group of uh, top tier leaders, they might be complaining about the staff or the they don't know anything or they don't seem committed or we're seeing a lot of the, you know, concerns around remote working and particularly with younger members of staff, they're not really, they don't really necessarily have the independence yet or the ability to be that autonomous. How, how, how do you suggest or begin to um, encourage those kinds of conversations inwards? Wow. Well, it's still evolving. Uh, Charlie mm -hmm. Warzel and his business partner and life partner wrote a book called Out of the Office, titled Out of the Office. Mm -hmm. And if I gleaned anything from that book, it's that this is still evolving, that there's been a huge disruption and we're still trying to figure it out. And um, so there are a couple of parts here. One is yeah. uh, during the, the pre-vaccination phase of the pandemic, um, when, you know, for the first very long time, you know, people were working exclusively remotely. Um, one office that I work with came up with open hours, open office hours, where a, a random group of employees would log on to Zoom and just have it running. Mm. And they shared virtual space with each other. And, and so... You know, they could hear people coughing in the next room or uh, children's, you know, education going on over there. But mostly they could ask questions of each other like, hey, do you know where in the files I can find such and such? And, um, and, and, and there was no agenda. It was just just um, ambient, you know. Yeah. And, and that, that was their space link. Uh, that firm has a really strong culture a really mm. strong culture. And, and it, it's that kind of understanding that practice is a design, the practice is a design project. Uh, and, and that we're going to keep it together and we're going to figure it out. And they, every six weeks, they survey their, their staff, like, how are we doing now with the pandemic and it's, you know, current, you know, situation and what can we do for you? And what can you do for us? And, what days are best now that we've been working Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the office, and we've been doing this for six weeks. How does that work for you? Should we be changing the day? Should we be in on Fridays and out on Wednesday? And, and, and it's not capricious because the way they contextualized it was to say, look, we're trying to figure this out. We know you are too. Every six weeks, we're going to come back and see if what we've been doing for the last month and a half is working. If mm -hmm. it's working, we'll keep that. If it's not working, we will discuss it. We're interested in your input. Not everybody gets what they want. But we're going to try to, you know, and 
they figure things out, but the main thing is they're talking all the time about culture in which they do their excellent work. Yeah. So, so that's, to me, that's a really strong example of the internal conversation where they're not talking about projects, you know? And in fact, we had a, uh, firm wide retreat, um, that was all virtual and it broke into discussion groups. And, and then the, the, the principals, uh, arranged for deliveries of dinner to everyone. And we all ate on screen together, the same meal in the depths of the darkest moment, you know, of the pandemic. And they kept us all together. It was, mm-hmm. it was really powerful stuff. And so, so that's the webbing, you know, and they talk about projects too. It's not, this is just, one area of holding a conversation where people are connected in another firm uh people the staff was really interested in various aspects of practice and so the founder said look if you're interested in that start a committee we want to hear what you have to say and it's not like they're going to come up with initiatives that are going to change the world but they've been empowered to come up to create a space to talk about sustainability and diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and recruitment and marketing and so on and technology and design standards. And if, if all of those individuals feel like fielding a committee to, to enhance the operation or function of the firm, that's culture. So those are mm-hmm. the internal, like that's where delegation and conversation internally is, is uh, powerful and effective. Amazing. Um, going back to this conversation of the evolution of of leadership, if you like, and the idea that um, the the leader is starting to learn how to delegate and empower the the rest of their team to be able to to be autonomous and take things on, and then they're at some point, yeah, you know, they might be met with, well, this wasn't what I signed up for, mm-hmm. or I don't want to be, you know, just running after and feeding the beast, if you like. I want to be in the design. I want to be doing the the you know, the drawings and the details. I became an architect to design, not to run a business. Mm -hmm. How do you help people like reconcile that reality, if you like? And I'll I'll add on to that as well, because one interesting comment I've heard from some of our clients in the past actually is, you know, actually them having success in relinquishing a lot of their, not responsibilities, but, you know, empowering other people to take on a lot of that work. And then being met with the fear, if you like, of what am I supposed to do? Right. Am I still needed? <laughs> and, you know. Which I thought was really fascinating. Well, can, can that leader, and we have this conversation, I will ask, can you live with the ambiguity of not knowing that mm. what you've been holding on to has helped make, bring your firm to this point? Do you have to hold on to that? If you Mm -hmm. do, let's figure out how. But more powerfully, can you live in the ambiguous state of not knowing what happens next? Because leaders always have one foot in the air. Mm -hmm. That is our state. That is our state of being. We know what will land. We don't know what it'll land on, but we know what will land. (laughs) And, And it's that state of constant... You know, that we're, leadership is not an easy place. Mm. And, and it involves navigating to places we may not really know. And if it's only about the object, the architected thing, okay. But what if there's more? Can we, can we, can we step into that not knowing? Mm-hmm. And, and, and actually kind of find joy in the not knowing. Because what we're doing is modeling for um, the people who follow us that we can do that. Because eventually, the successors behind us will find themselves in that same position. And I think part of it is, you know, a leader does things in her or his own kind of idiosyncratic, bespoke way. And then people who might be successors are anticipating what their leader is doing. So they don't really have the freedom to be that bespoke way. They're carbon copying, but maybe in conflict with how things are done. And 
the firm is named after the founder, but my name is something else. How do I fit in mm-hmm. here? Um, and and so it's what I call anticipatory leadership, where they're 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 trying to lead and step away from management and truly lead, but they are also anticipating how their leader who pays them would expect them to perform. <laughs> And, and, you know, and, and that's really hard because the principal has certain yeah. expectations. The employee has expectations and it's a difficult place. I know for myself that when I stepped away from uh, corporate uh, um, practice and started my own practice, that was the moment where I found my voice. I, I, I didn't have to kind of be afraid to speak my own voice anymore. Not that I, did, I could have at the other place, you know, the first place. I didn't know I could until I was on my own. And so I see that and I share this conversation with leaders like Mm. what voice can you create a space as you and I have that I'm creating the space for a leader to share these thoughts openly. Can we create a similar space for your next in line so that, so that they can develop that, that powerful voice that you have. That's very powerful to, to, to think about it like that, that you're actually as a leader creating a space for other leaders or for the other team members to show up and discover their own leadership, right. if you like. Right. Yeah. And, you know, very, I, I, you know, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, I, 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 yeah, I, I love that as a, as a concept. And, and I think that the, I think hearing that as a team member or somebody who's interested in leadership, um, how would you how would you advise for someone who's interested in becoming a leader in a in a practice to create that space for themselves or negotiate that space if they don't necessarily see it above them or available to them Ooh. it's it's there's no these conversations are tailor made and they really yep. are contingent on who i'm speaking with and whether mm-hmm. they this individual has um, a clear enough confidence and knowledge of what they truly want that are. And my question would be, are you insulated in the projects where you don't have exposure to the rest of the business? If so, why? What yeah. aspects of the business are interesting to you and why? Do you want to lead other people? How do you manage your projects? And, you know, the, I think that those initial questions help because the initial answers are not, are not the final answers. We're, you know, we're, you know, when we're talking about a principal who's in her fifties and there's a, a candidate for succession who's in her thirties, they, they have other, they, they may be really focused on the projects. You know, I, I have a little exercise that I do with, I I engage with folks. It's hard to do here in this interview, but, but if, if you can imagine, you know, in graduate school, we draw, I say, draw a grid of 10 squares, uh, five over five, you know, it's just a grid five over five. That's what we learn in school. And each of those squares is a project. But break yep. up, break up those squares just in space. So they're all floating in space. Those are your projects. Now draw a big rectangle around them. And that traditional <laughs> space is practice. Yeah. And, and that's where we have to focus. There's a context for this work that we were never taught. Mm-hmm. We weren't taught about client relations. We weren't taught about the difference between professional and non-professional clients, which is not a cynical comment. It's just, residential clients aren't necessarily the same as a university client or a hospital client. Yep. And, you know, we weren't taught about billing or contracts or exposure, except in a very limited way. So we don't have to explain all that to clients. It helps to share in an accessible way with our teams and our internally, what these are. And we can, we can have layers of transparency. We don't have to share everything with everyone, but there might be, layers where things are understood. I work with one firm where this is very, very clearly um, established 
where uh, principals and all other staff, you know, all the tasks and things that the firm did is, was put into a big matrix. And then who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted and who's informed uh, so that I as a junior can see diagonally through this what my path of advancement might be. And then they posted this beautiful thing in the studio with a pencil attached on a string so that people could make comments or ask questions and like, I don't understand what this connection is or how do I get from here to here? Mm. Um, and understanding that it's not about time, it's about experience. And so, so they, and internally, like you had to walk by this chart to get to the kitchen, to get your sandwich. And so, you know, th th there was no way that you could avoid engaging with this, um, very transparent invitation from the founders and this firm, you know, founded by two men eventually in very short order is now owned by four women. And, and that, you know, that, and, and so there's this path for um, all kinds of, you know, architects at different levels to see their path moving up. That's why I say leadership is not necessarily about knowing it. it you know, this was an emergent kind of, um, process that they really took seriously you know um and and it and it and it filter and it, and it and it kind of reads through the whole organization it's a group of people yeah. that has very long tenure they seldom people seldom leave it's not a cult it's just a great place to work where you are secure in the knowledge that you can advance if you accomplish certain things mm -hmm. fascinating Really, really, very, very, very fascinating. Um, to conclude here, um, just before we started recording, we were talking about speaking languages and your 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 bilingual, trilingual, mm -hmm. and you were talking about how when you speak French, that you you're actually a different person. It's a different part of your personality, and then you. Um, started to liken this to architecture and it kind of really ties in very nicely here about the, with the whole conversation that we've had that architecture is a conversation if you like and business is a series of conversations and architecture is the language if you like could you tell us a little bit more about about that and then the sort of distinction between you know identifying with the language or mm -hmm. well i um i'll stumble through it it's it's a uh, it's hard to explain i Speaking French, on one level, it's strictly communication, but I lived in France mm -hmm. uh, part-time for 30 years, and um, it was enough of, a, uh, of an infusion when I would be there that um, I understood that it was more than just saying words, that engaging with my neighbors and other people uh, in the community, that um, I embodied something different there was a there's a cultural context in which the language occurs that is not just skin deep and and i realized at some point that that's the same the same is true for me with architecture that it is not me it is a language it is separate from mm. me and i think the risk in architecture is that it's it's a bit like a tight suit or a tattoo that we think is part of us or it's snug and yet it's not. And, and I think understanding that, being aware of that separation allows an architect, it allowed me to redefine what I think architecture can be. Because if I just assume that it's something that I'm dipped in and becomes part of me, that I, <laughs> that, that it's, that I've, I've given up part of myself and that my clients benefit from me differentiating between the language and, and being compassionate and, 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 and empathic and empathetic about the language mm -hmm. and understanding it from having practiced for 25 years and separating myself from that, uh, that I can, that I was able to redefine how I engage with practice, that it is not part of me. It is with me and I can, I can morph it and change it the way I want to. And in that way, model for other leaders in architecture, the importance of, of bringing people up, creating a culture, breaking things up, 
thinking differently about how we engage that um, with architecture as a language. That it's not just the building. There's so much more, like we talked about earlier, yeah. collaboration and so on. Yeah, it was that, it's that the box with all the little squares inside of it. It's the interstitial right. space. Right. I think that, that as a concept and idea is very powerful, certainly for architects to kind of understand, well, yeah, this is, you know, we're interested in space. We're interested in the context of things and, you know, the context with which design takes place, the conversations with which design takes place has an impact on, well, the, the end product of the building, but also on the, the quality of experience and for everybody who's in, involved with it. And it can make or break a business. You know, a, a colleague of mine, I agree, and a colleague of mine uh, works in healthcare. He, he was just acknowledged with an award for his work. It's tremendous. Uh, a healthcare organization actually um, um, asked him to design a carpet for their, all of their millions of square feet but the way he approaches healthcare is not just, you know, nice woods and grass wall cloth and so forth. Uh, he understands that hospitals are healing environments and that not only for the patients, but for the, the hundreds and thousands of people who work there for, you know, 12, 14 hour shifts that he can imagine what it's like to be a, a patient on a gurney looking up at a ceiling and what does that ceiling look like and how, how do we illuminate it and what are the materials that we use? And not only that, but what's the light level for the physician that is, you know, seeing a patient every eight minutes. And, and so, so instead of just kind of thinking in terms of design, we're, oh, we're going to use these materials and just kind of put it all up. He's thinking more mm -hmm. deeply about the context. And that's what I mean about it's a, it's a language and it's separate from me. And I have the opportunity to think differently about how I engage in this profession. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Really, absolutely fascinating, Michael. So thank you very much thank you, um, for the conversation and, and, and the depth of your inquiry here. Um, and it's a, you know, there's so much to kind of keep going here with, with leadership in architecture practice, how we create powerful business environments, the power of conversation and the power of culture in terms of, you know, producing fantastic work and, and contributing to the city and furthering the profession. So thank you very much for it's, your conversation today. It's been my pleasure, Ryan. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed our conversation. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.